Page 152. Rav Soloveitchik was telling us last week that there are many steps to the tshuva. There's that first pondering of the tshuva. Those become more solidified thoughts of tshuva. That makes a person actually want to do tshuva. But Rav Soloveitchik says that tshuva is not complete unless there is vidui, a confession that goes along with it. One must actually put into words what it is that they did wrong. And I'm reading the second paragraph on page 152. I hope this is not digressing or too early, but um, one's perception of oneself, one's akarot, good deeds, etc., etc., it's very complex sometimes. And uh, to be able to express sometimes everything that you did wrong, and sometimes, I mean, there are those things that come with spontaneously on the Yom and Narayim that you get deep enough in yourself, you know, oh, wow, you're so aware of this now, and it comes up. And other times it's not so clear. For sure. And, and, and this is, well, part of doing Shuvah is having to dig deep inside of our, our, our consciousness, in our, literally in our kidneys, to look, to look inside and find out what it is that we're doing. But these actions, what Rav Salvejo is trying to say is something that Shuvah is not complete without Vidu. That's what the Rambam was trying to say, and he's trying to explain the reason for that. On the root of translating thoughts into actions, these thoughts must become formulated, physical. They must become physical in, in words. With logical sentences. Thought alone. They can even be thoughts that are truthful thoughts and they penetrate up until the midst of a person. Thoughts do not become solidified unless they are put into words. There's many truths that we know about ourselves. But we, were, we will not dare say them out loud. Not only in public. We won't even say them privately. We won't talk about them. Even when it's just us in the room. To think about something that I did wrong, okay. But to speak about it, even when I'm alone, inside of the room, to put that into words is a very difficult thing. Klal lokal, it is not easy at all. Lenasech machshavot haruchshot banu. They said it's not even easy to formulate the proper words and sentences. Lenasech here means to put together a nusach. You know, to say... you have many thoughts, but to put them into words is very difficult. How much more difficult does it become when these words do not flatter us? They don't. It's easy to say nice things about myself, but it's difficult. Someone says, "What are you good at?" On stage, you start to mumble because it's very hard. You know what you're good at, but it's hard to put that into words. Now someone says, "Tell me the worst thing you ever did in your life." You think I'm going to put that in words? You know how hard it is for me in my own room to say that in words, the worst thing that I did? It'll be all over Facebook these days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a it. But it's really, you're standing naked. Sure, absolutely. Spiritually. But, but you're, not, you're not even naked in front of somebody. It's in front of yourself. You're alone. This is yeah. just you. Well, most people will say, uh, you have so many things, I don't know what the worst thing is. You know, <laughs> i got to think about this. <laughs> Man, I don't even know where to start. envy yeah. doing. But that's the whole point, is without this experience of bearing your soul, there is no vidui. Confession is not beating your chest. Confession is becoming bare. It is, it is verbalizing the things that we're so terrified to even say. Not to somebody else, to ourselves. And therefore, vidui is not something so easy. You know, in order to have proper tshuva, you have to have vidui. Sure, I do that three times a day in my uh, tefillah. No, you don't do vidui three times a day. I would doubt if you do vidui once every 20 years. Vidui is a real, it's a real moment in a person's life. I think it seems that people need somebody to measure themselves with in terms of that. Because, you know, you hear of people all the time, like they haven't spoken to their brothers or sisters in like 20 years yeah. because of something that happened or, you know, they have a resentment about something or they're stuck in a behavior where they keep sabotaging themselves over and over and over again. When you try to talk to them, it's like, there's no problem. But it seems like the relationship with Kedushah is different in that it really is like a 
beam of light that forces you to expose that. I think it's one, one, re one reason people are very scared of Shuvah. Uh, very, very good, because Shuvah is a scary thing. It makes you go, you don't know what you're going to come out like on the other side, if you're real with yourself. Aval, Ilu Hayakal, if it was easy, the Torah will not demand from us Shuvah, if you do it, if it was easy. If it was something that was so easy that it doesn't require any kind of effort, what kind of mitzvah would be in this vidui? If the Rambam emphasizes so much this mitzvah of vidui, of confessing, if the Rambam is making such a big deal out of something, it must mean that it's very difficult. It's not something that just comes... Uh, not, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I was already talking to Hashem, so I just threw in my vidui in there. Uh, vidui is something that requires not just that, but there's, actual effort. But there is the idea of zman, though, that there's a time where it becomes propitious to do so in the, in the mood. Okay, very good. The month of Elu, we believe, is a time where we're more, we've created a, there's a certain consciousness in the world, there's a feeling in the world, there's a kedusha in the world, of course. Vidui is there, this vidui, afhu eno maase pitomi, it's not even a sudden action that comes about. Alachat kama v'kama sheino ma'aseh michani. Translate that word for me. Michani. How much more so it is not a mechanical action. Shel amira v'peh. Is that a new word? Yeah. They did not get the word machine from us. Shel amira v'peh. It's not this mechanical go through the motions, just say the vidui that's printed in your book. It's an integral part of the action of tshuva. It is the end, but not just the end, it is the, the climax of the whole act of tshuva, is vidui. Being able to actually get it out of my guts, what it is that I'm doing, what it is that I need to fix. Uchshem shen atshuva shlemam ad shelo hivia ta adam page one fifty three of the vidui and just like tshuva is not complete until it brings a person to do vidui kach ena vidui vidui that's a very beautiful it's a Rav Soloveitchik sentence just like your tshuva is not a tshuva unless it has caused you to reach this bare state of vidui so too your vidui is not a vidui your confession is not a confession. If it does not burst forth in flames from the furnace, which is tshuva. If your vidui came from a book and not from your soul, if your vidui isn't just something that exploded inside of you, but it's something that you, oh, I'll say it, you know, I'll say it, okay. It's like when he doesn't, I tell him, I'm sorry, you're sorry. I'm sorry. Wait, that's tshuva, that's vidui, that's a vidui. Do it with like in his guts. And it doesn't take a long time till he gets there. He realizes what I did was so wrong that I owe someone else an apology. And do you know that sometimes somebody will say, I'm sorry to you? They're an adult. And you can ask one question. You shouldn't because it's not fair. But if you were to ask them, what are you sorry for? It's very difficult for them to say. Even though you know and they know, but to say it is very difficult. But that's what you doing. What you do is being able to say the things that's, that's part of the process, the process of bearing your soul. And their soul is just like tshuva, it's not a tshuva. Well, that vidui, the vidui can't be mechanical. It must come from the furnace, which is called tshuva. Do you have to follow the same process when you're apologizing to an individual person for wrong? Very good. Um, Rav, Rav, uh, the Rambam was mentioned earlier that with a Hashem, you have to go to tshuva and vidui in front of him. With a person, you have to make up with them, and then you must go to tshuva and vidui with Hashem. I mean, when you harm a person, you're not just harming them. You're also harming the Baruch Hu, your relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, and therefore it requires a vidui, but that vidui is worthless unless you first made up. I mean, you can't ask Hashem for I forgiveness so. on so something you, you did to somebody else. But you yeah. do have to go through the process of, of connecting to Hashem after you apologize to them. It, Absolutely. Very yeah. good. This is a very good point. Exactly. And you just brought up, uh, Jack brought up something that I was selling, uh, one of my students in Yerushalayim sent to me, a teaching. I wanted to. You know this famous 
teaching of... Uh, but we don't do Viduri on Rosh Hashanah. Correct, because Rosh Hashanah is a happy day. Rosh Hashanah is not a day of atonement. We don't so really so mention atonement really at all. So the Slichot and, uh, and Yom Kippur, Kippur are it. Yes. Well, it seems like the repetitions of the Viduri, even though it may be mechanical, it, if you keep doing it, it's like, it's like working your muscles to say, okay, now I'm ready, now I can get in the ring. Correct. You should in Baltimore. The Rosh Hashanah only let them do th like three vidus, right? One vidu, mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt that the Mishnah Buah writes that it's better, quotes the Talmud, it's better to do less but with more intention than a lot of them with no intention. And so they tried to put an emphasis on some of them, and that, yeah. that's changing the text of the Tfilah, but it was for a good reason. And I mean, it seems, it seems on, that, on that basis that it, it's kind of excessive that it's on every, you know, every non or every talk noon day you have to do it right I mean, like, oh, and, and, yeah. in the morning in the afternoon and at night before we go to yeah, bed yeah yeah that's a lot of you do it that doesn't do necessarily mean anything and usually people rush through it sure like it's how much time do they give you for yeah. doing it? It's, yeah. it's even worse on yom kippur when they rush through it that, that's the part that's so, but, so you should join us we don't rush anything yeah, in yom kippur yeah, yeah. yeah. Have all oh, day. that's one day i can say but we don't rush anything <laughs> oh Hashem. Um, there's a, a teaching that I got here. I don't know the book, but I'm just quoting from a German rabbi. Ketuv b'sefer niflaot chadashot, parashat acharei. There's a book called Niflaot Chadashot, and it's in the parasha of Achrei Mot, Achrei Mot. Shamati, I heard, b'shem hagaon hakadosh, the name of the holy genius. Rabbi, I don't know his name, Avushil, Avushil, is that Mi Frankfurt de Main. Of Frankfurt. שהיה לו בערב יום הכיפורים איזה מאות שאלות והיו כולם קשרות. He had on ערב יום כיפור a few hundred people who came to show them their animals, their chickens, if they were kosher. And he said that all of them are kosher. Every person that came, kosher, 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 kosher. And it's not a normal thing because not every animal you slaughter is kosher. ותמהו עליו הבדין שלו. And his בדין was, was critiqued him. So what are you doing? How could you do this? How could you make all these animals kosher? His Beitim, his own two Dayanim, they were they had a question on him. Amar Lahem, he told them, Shemi Shosem Mikasher Terefa, that somebody who makes a kosher animal, a Terefa, not kosher, who Averash of Anadam Lechavero, that is a sin between me and another person. They came to me with their chicken, and I hurt them by telling them that chicken is not kosher, even if it's true. But I made an Avera for them. Because really the chicken yeah. could have been kosher, but I tarif. Aval hausem mitrefa kasher. But if there's a not kosher animal, and I, meaning it's a kosher chicken, but they, they slaughtered, they found it inside, it's not kosher. And I say that it's kosher, I am not harming them. I'm only harming kadosh baruch It's between my relationship with me and Hashem. Ve'avera sheben adam lemakom yom hakipurim mechaper. And the sins between me and Hashem are forgiven on yom hakipurim. But my sins between me and my fellow people, in Yom HaKippurim Mechaper. Yom HaKippurim itself will not atone for me. But you can't do something and say, oh, I'll do it now, but on Yom Kippur I'm going to do it too. Bro. Correct. What he's saying is, if you're going to err on the side of caution, err on the side of letting people eat things that might not be kosher. Err on the side of offending God directly instead and not of the people. person. And not people. This is a big lesson. Yeah. This is a big lesson. And and I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that it comes from Ashkenaz. I have to tell you this. In Ashkenaz, logic reigns supreme. This is almost to a, a flaw. But Judaism was a Talmudic Judaism. If I could prove to you that halakhically I'm right, that's all that matters. How that Judaism in today's world has become perhaps one of the more extreme Judaisms, I don't know. It's not logical. It is not logical that when you say, oh, that's an Ashkenazi stringency. Ashkenazi and stringency are not supposed to go together. I'm, I'm telling this is the wow. truth. They're not things that should work together. Like, who was more proficient in the writings of the Gemara? Ashkenazi. I'm not embarrassed to tell you this. I'm not. In Swaradim, we were poskim, halal, halakha, and a lot of Kabbalah. But Gemarot, this is uh, Germany, this is Lithuania, this is Russia. This is where these people, this came from. And for that world to become, everything is not kosher. The air, everything is not kosher unless we say it's kosher. That's the exact opposite. But I'm not surprised that he was the, the chief rabbi in Frankfurt. Amen. This is the exact logic that a rabbi from Frankfurt would use. 
And then he says at the end, just to reassure all the people in the Bedin, He said, don't worry, my Dayanim. All the animals that were kosher, they really were kosher. It's not that they were animals that were not kosher and I said they were kosher, but I'm telling you that even if I was wrong, I was still doing the right thing. But he says, don't worry, all the animals were really kosher. This mentality, this side of halakha, you know, people don't, I don't know they know that when a rabbi comes to Erev Yom Kippurim, you almost don't have time to do tshuva for all the things that you do in your personal life. Like most of Yom Kippurim is doing tshuva, and, and a person who's not a community leader doesn't pick up these nuances on the text of Yom Kippurim because they're not community leaders. But how much of the tshuva is tshuva that we're doing on a communal level? If not oh, for gosh. our community, but for the things we do to That's our community that are not sinners. correct. It says we have permission to pray with so, sinners. Very good. Drain. But I, you know how many times I think I didn't believe that I visit enough of the people in my community when they were sick? Did I do that right? Was I really by everybody's hospital bed when I should have been? Did I, did I visit every Shiva house in a timely fashion? I saw somebody at Shul that wasn't doing well. Did I really call it out? Every year, Yom Kippurim, I ask myself the same question. And I know that my colleagues around the world are doing the same thing. And what Rav Avishai, I don't know how to pronounce his name, this rabbi, is telling us is, Erev Yom Kippurim, I want to come clean from the avirot between me and other people. Because I knew Mekim Bolim, Hashem could help me with everything that I did wrong against them. The things I did wrong against other people, how in the world is a rabbi supposed to run after all the people he met in the whole year and ask them forgiveness? It would be much better for us to err on the side of caution and mess up like that with, other pe- with, with Hashem than with other people. A friend Hashem, a close who can handle it. And to end off... Uh, Doesn't it also say that the day itself atones? Correct. Um, the Marlene's right. You can't leave things for Yom Kippur. You, you can't, like, I'm going I'm to eat pig today. And Yom Kippur, I'm going to ask again. That doesn't work. The, one of the few tshuvahs that are not acceptable is a tshuva that you plan to do in the future. Yeah. And that's uh, one of the ch- things that Hashem doesn't accept. But in in, in this stop price, last night I was learning with my wife. We were studying from Malapel. It's one of his books. Malapel says that in the Torah it says, who is like this Jewish people so great, so amazing, so wonderful, so... He said, which mitzvot do you think? He said, what do you learn from here? You learn that HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares about the way the non-Jews are going to view the Jewish people. The Jews are, eh, forget the non-Jews. We could do whatever. That's not a Jewish attitude. Hashem says the Jewish, the non-Jewish world has to look at us and say, who is that? Look how amazing these people are. And he says, and how do you think you're going to get the non-Jews to think we're so amazing? Is that you think we're going to impress them because we only eat things with three hechshers on them? He writes. So you think we're going to impress them? We only keep Yashan. We don't eat Chadash. We only keep Yashan. So you think that's going to impress the guy in the church across the street? He said, what's going to impress the world is when they know that when we do business with them, when we interact with them, we come across as the most refined, the most caring, the most sympathetic people. Ben Adam the Chaviro is the only part that's going to impress the world. And the that he cries over a generation that is so built on refining the, the relation between us and Hashem, and absolutely not and everybody else. On Shabbat when I was teaching Prakeavot, the last sentence I didn't read because I didn't get there, Rav Masas says, he, he basically records all of his drashot. In the last sentence he said, he said, I reached out to my community and I told them that they should have derch eretz, uh, they should be kind, v'savlanut, and they should be patient with the Arabs that live around them. That was the end of his speech. It was before Rosh Hashanah. It says, even with the Arabs, this is a tall order. You're talking about people who are, are, are in Israel running after us to kill us. But even on a, per- we're not talking here national politics, on a personal level, you're going to the grocery store and there's an Arab guy behind the counter. You treat him like you would any other human being. He deserves that treatment. And we as Ami said, even if we feel he doesn't deserve the treatment, we must go above and beyond what it is that we're supposed to do because of this whole point. The whole point is that the world should say, look at Am Yisrael, look at the people who follow Hashem, look how good they are. To not have complaints about us, to not have, to make a world where people say a Jewish person, if I do business with them, they're going to be the most honest people in the world. And I think we still have work to do in this department. And Bezat Hashem, we're going to fix it. That's what we should focus on. Hashem Kippurim, err on the side of caution with human beings. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is big enough to handle himself. And we should have a good evening.